morning, church. Can you hear me? Yeah, good morning, everyone. We have reached chapter 17 in our sermon series on the book of Acts. And I trust that you have learned many precious lessons along the way. So to recap, let me draw your attention to a verse that holds the book together. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, the book of Acts can be divided into three parts in line with Acts 1.8. In part 1, from chapters 1 to 7, we see the work of the Holy Spirit among the Jews in Jerusalem. The number of believers increased to more than 5,000, and the church grew in faith and strength. In part 2, from chapters 8 to 12, we see the work of the Holy Spirit extending to all Judea and Samaria and the surroundings. Because of persecution, the believers were dispersed throughout Judea and Samaria and they preached the word wherever they went. Philip brought the gospel to the Samaritans. Peter brought the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul had a dramatic encounter with Christ and he turned from a persecutor to a passionate proclaimer of the gospel. And in part 3, from Acts chapter 13 to 28, we see the work of the Holy Spirit extending to the ends of the earth through the missionary journeys of Paul. On Paul's first missionary journey, he partnered Barnabas and he brought the gospel to different cities in Cyprus, Pamphylia and Galatia. On Paul's second missionary journey, he partnered Silas and Timothy. They began with a visit to strengthen the churches in Syria, Cilicia and Galatia. Paul then received a vision calling him to Macedonia in Europe. So the gospel was brought from Asia across to Europe, starting from the city of Philippi. So this morning, we will continue to follow the footsteps of Paul on his second missionary journey. In chapter 17, we will see Paul reaching out to three different groups of people. The skeptics in Thessalonica, the seekers in Beria, and the intellectuals in Athens. Let us pray. Dear Father, we want to thank you for your message for us this morning. Help us pay attention, help us understand, help us remember what you have to say to us. Open our eyes that we may behold your wonder and your glory. Ignite our hearts with your word. Set us on fire so that we may be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's begin by reading verse 1 to 4. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scripture, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Now some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Now Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia. So during Paul's days, major trade routes ran through the city. So it was a wealthy and a cosmopolitan port city. You can visit this historic city in northern Greece today. And it happens to be the birthplace of Pfizer CEO Albert Bula, the man behind the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, so what were the Thessalonians like and what was their attitude towards the gospel? We see in verse 2 to 4 that Paul had to reason with them from the scriptures, explain and prove that Jesus is the Messiah and to persuade them so it wasn't a straightforward gospel presentation. He had to reason, explain, prove, and persuade, not just on one occasion, but on three Sabbath days before some of them believe. So I put it to you that the Thessalonians, they were skeptics. Now, skeptics are people who are doubtful. 
guarded about the gospel. They ask difficult questions and they wouldn't believe until they see evidences. They are tough nuts to crack. So how did Paul reach out to them? What can we learn from Paul in sharing the gospel with skeptics? Firstly, position. Now notice that Paul positioned himself strategically. Whenever there was a synagogue in the city, it was Paul's custom to go there first. But why? Why first to the synagogue? Well, the synagogue was a gathering place for Jews and God-fearing Gentiles. On every Sabbath day, they would come together for prayer and scripture reading. And it was also the practice for the synagogue to invite visitors who were well-educated to speak at their weekly meetings. Now, Paul was a Pharisee and he had studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel is this highly esteemed rabbi. So Paul would more than qualify as a well-educated visitor. Now, so in the synagogue, Paul would have the opportunity to speak and he would have a gospel-ready audience, people who were interested in spiritual matters, people who honored God's word. So the synagogue was a strategic launching point for the gospel to penetrate a new community. Secondly, preparation. Paul was all prepared to defend the gospel. He was armed with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now Paul proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah. He had to suffer, die, and rise from the dead. Now, but the Jews, they held a different view about the Messiah. In their mind, the Messiah would come as a conquering king, defeat the enemies, deliver the people from bondage, and, uh, and restore Israel to her former glory. So they were skeptical about Jesus. Now, how did Paul persuade them? Well, he did intensive Bible study with them. He reasoned with them from scriptures, he explained the meaning of difficult passages, and he presented evidences from the scripture to prove his point. Now, there are more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that deal with the birth, the ministry, death, and resurrection of the Messiah. For example, 1,000 years ago, King David had already foretold with precise details in Psalm 22 about Jesus' sufferings on the cross. And 700 years before Christ, the prophet Isaiah had written in Isaiah 53 about Jesus as the suffering servant of the Lord who was punished by God and pierced for our transgressions. And 500 years before Christ, Zechariah had already spoken about the 30 pieces of silver that Judas took when he betrayed Jesus and later used to purchase a porter's field. So Paul could just go on and on with prophecy after prophecy. Now, re research has shown that for eight of these most specific prophecies to come true in one person, the probability is minuscule. It's just one in 10 to the power of 17. That's 100 quadrillion. And for 16 prophecies to come true in one person, the probability reduces to 1 in 10 to the power of 45. Yet Jesus fulfilled them all. He fulfilled not 8, not 16, but each of the more than 300 ad prophecies. So the evidence for Jesus as the Messiah is overwhelming. Now we have seen how Paul positioned himself in the synagogue and was prepared to defend the gospel. Now let us dig a little deeper into Paul's own perspective of his outreach to the Thessalonians. Can you hear better now? <laughs> okay. Okay, just now let's recap a bit. Now we had dig a little, okay, we had seen how Paul positioned himself in the synagogue and was prepared to defend the gospel. Now let us dig a little deeper into Paul's own perspective of his outreach to the Thessalonians. And his thoughts are recorded for us in his letter to the Thessalonians. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1, verse 5, he said, 
Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. So Paul, he had a power source to tap into. It is the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Paul's preaching may fall short on some days. His courage and zeal may falter at times, and he may not have all the answers, but he has the Holy Spirit to rely on. For it is the Holy Spirit who brings deep conviction of sin. It is the Holy Spirit who takes away our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. He removes our blindness so that we can see the light of the gospel. So preaching the gospel simply with words is not enough. Paul may plant the seed. Silas and Timothy may do the watering, but it is God through the power of the Holy Spirit who gives the growth. So far, we have seen the importance of position, preparation, and power. But there's one more crucial element in the outreach of Paul, and it is presence. Paul told the Thessalonians, you know how we live among you for your sake. How did Paul live among them? How did he live out the gospel through his presence in their lives? Now we can gather more insights from the second chapter of his letter to the Thessalonians. In verse two, Paul and Silas had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. They were stripped, beaten with rods, and severely flogged. Now, but the strong opposition and the pain and the scars on their backs could not stop them from sharing the gospel. They demonstrated absolute faith in the gospel. They were so sure that Jesus is the Messiah. Their lives were sold out for Christ. And in verse 9, the missionaries, they worked day and night to earn their own living in order not to be a burden to anyone while they preached the gospel. Now, people could see that they were not there for the money. They were not there to get anything out of the Thessalonians. They had no hidden agenda. And in verse 10, the missionaries, they were holy, righteous, and blameless in all their ways. They practiced what they preached. They were genuine and authentic. And in verses 7 to 12, the missionaries, they cared for the believers just as a nursing mother cares for her children. They dealt with them as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging them in the faith. Now, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. The missionaries really loved and cared. So what was the result of their outreach? In verse 4, some of the Jews and many of the Greeks were persuaded. There were some who remained skeptical. Not everyone will respond to the gospel. But for those who believed, to hearing the gospel, to seeing the lives of the missionaries through the touch of the Holy Spirit, their skepticism was melted away. Now while Paul rejoiced over the first harvest, troubles soon followed. Verse 5 to 10 tells us that the unbelieving Jews started a riot. The city was in an uproar. Their host Jason had his house raided. The young believers were charged with harboring troublemakers and rebels. Paul, Silas, and Timothy were forced to leave that very night in the cover of darkness. What an abrupt end to their ministry in Thessalonica. Now what was going to happen to the young believers left behind? Would their faith be strong enough to withstand the persecution and hardship? <clears throat> now the missionaries, they were very concerned and they prayed continually for the Thessalonians. <clears throat> A few months later, Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to visit the, the believers and Timothy returned with a glowing report. In the midst of severe suffering, the young believers persevered with a joy given by the Holy Spirit. They became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Their faith had become known everywhere. The Thessalonian believers had transformed from skeptics to a model church in Macedonia and Achaia. 
Now, John Piper said this, every day, in every circumstance, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, but you may be aware of only three of them. Paul was separated from his spiritual children, but in his absence, God was working among them, strengthening their faith, honing their character, imparting courage and widening their influence for his glory. Praise the Lord. Okay, so now let us move on with Paul to the next place, barrier. In verse 10, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, Berea was about 72 kilometers southwest of Thessalonica. It was also a prosperous city in Macedonia with a large Jewish community. So on arrival, Paul followed his modus operandi and he went straight to the synagogue to share the gospel. Now, what was the attitude of the Bereans towards the gospel. The Bereans were seekers, earnest seekers of the truth. In verse 11, now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. The Greek word for more noble character is eugenous steroid, which means generous in spirit. So like a pair of open hands, the Bereans had open minds and open hearts, they were open to give and they were open to receive. They great, graciously gave Paul airtime. They listened to him and they welcomed his teaching. They didn't dismiss Paul's proclamation about the Messiah. Instead, they received the message with great eagerness. Now, the Greek word for eagerness is protumia, which means zeal, enthusiasm, and readiness. Okay, just picture a starving man devouring his food or an extremely thirsty man reaching out for ice cold water. The Barians were like very hungry for the word, very thirsty for the truth. They were zealous to know Jesus. And next we see that they examined the scriptures every day to see if, if what Paul said was true. The Greek word for examine is anakrino. Anna means again, crino means to sift. So put together, anno crino is to sift again and again, to sift up and down repeatedly and intensely. Now, anno crino can be used as a legal term to describe a judge in a trial, scrutinizing every detail, cross-examining the witnesses, carefully evaluating the evidences. So over here, the message of Paul was on trial judged by the Barians to see if it lived up and lined up with God's word. So the Barians, they examine the scriptures every day to seek out the truth, observe the text, look at the context, compare cross-references and meditate upon the truth. And the result is recorded in verse 12. Many of them believe, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So the verdict is out. The gospel is true, Jesus is the Messiah. While the Thessalonians were skeptics, the Barians, they were seekers. While the Thessalonians needed proof and persuasion, the Barians, they were proactive in seeking out the truth for themselves. While the Thessalonians were like hard ground that required deep plowing, the Barians were a field right unto harvest. Now, Rick Warren said this, if you approach the Bible as a skeptic, it's going to be a closed book to you. But if you approach the Bible with reverence and humility, you will find it opening up like a flower. So may we have the spirit of the Barians to be of noble character, to receive the word with great eagerness, and to examine scriptures every day with great reverence and humility. Now what happened next? Verse 13 to 15 tell us that just like before, Paul's ministry in Berea was interrupted by attacks from the unbelieving Jews. When God is at work, we can expect opposition from the enemy. But Paul did not lose heart. He left Silas and Timothy to take care of the young believers in Berea while he proceeded to Athens alone. 
Okay, is everyone still with me on our journey to Greece? Let us move on to Athens. Verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, mm, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing us some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners, foreigners who lived there spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Now Athens was the intellectual and cultural center of Greece, renowned for its art and philosophy. It was like the learning center of the world. And there were two predominant schools of philosophy, the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans' goal in life is to pursue pleasure, comfort, materialism. They believe there's a God, but to them, God is distant, uninvolved, and uninterested in their lives. Now, in contrast, the Stoics, they live to pursue reason, logic, self-mastery. They were very disciplined. So they think of God as an impersonal force found in all nature and in control of everything. Now, what was the attitude of the Athenians towards the gospel? The Athenians were intellectuals. They spent their time talking about and listening to the latest idea. So to them, the gospel was like a new teaching with strange ideas. They were curious to find out more, to add on to their knowledge. So how did Paul reach out to them? What can we learn from Paul about sharing the gospel with intellectuals? Firstly, compassion and passion. Now, verse 16 tells us that Paul was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Why was he greatly distressed? Now, if you were to walk around Athens during the time of Paul, you were more likely to meet a god than a man because there were like 30,000 idols in the city and just 10,000 men at that time. And Paul wasn't walking around Athens just casually or passively like a tourist. He was actually in prayer walk mode, alert and sensitive to the spiritual darkness around him. He could see that the Athenians were desperately lost and in need of a savior. And he felt this deep compassion rising up for them. More than that, he was filled with this righteous anger when he looked at the streets filled with idols. How could the people choose these worthless idols over the true and living God. They have robbed God of the worship, the honor, and the glory that he deserved. So Paul's passion for God and compassion for people motivated him to go beyond the synagogue into the marketplace. Day by day, he never stopped sharing about Jesus with anyone who happened to be there. Now church, when we walk around Taman Jurong and the Lakeside District, are our eyes open to the spiritual condition of the community around us? May God take away our indifference and give us this renewed compassion and passion for his people. Now back to Paul. His preaching and debates with the philosophers earned him an invitation to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was a council made up of the greatest philosophers and the key opinion leaders in Athens. They met regularly to discuss religion and culture. Now, interestingly, the location where they met was also called the Areopagus or Mars Hill. 
And in fact, if you go to Athens today, you can see this bronze plaque at the side of the hill with the full text of Paul's sermon in Acts 17 in Greek. So let us find out what he said to them. In verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now Paul began his sermon by seeking a common ground to connect with his audience. He broke the ice by paying them a very sincere compliment for being very religious. It's very good that you're interested in spiritual matters. Then he took time and effort to walk around and look carefully at the objects of worship. He sought to understand their religious viewpoint so that he could better communicate with them. Then he made use of the altar to an unknown God as a bridge to transit into his gospel presentation. So like Paul, we need to ask the Lord for open doors to connect with our pre-believer friends. <clears throat> and to ask for creative ideas, how can we transit from a normal conversation to a spiritual conversation? And it helps when we are really genuinely interested in their lives and we take time to listen to them first before we even share. Now sharing our faith with intellectuals can be very intimidating and nerve-wracking. They are often smarter, sharper, more scholarly, more sophisticated than us. They may ask some chim questions that we cannot answer or have some clever arguments that we cannot retort. Now, the Athenians especially, they hail from this long line of famous philosophers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Now, what could Paul say to them? Well, Paul was clear about his mission. He was there for a spiritual conversation, not a confrontation. <clears throat> he wasn't there to win a debate or to put his opponents down or to impress them. His mission was to share God's love and to love them. Now, the intellectuals might have some hate knowledge about God, but they don't know God's heart and they don't know about Jesus. Even the most put-together person, the smartest and the most successful, they have some deep security, insecurity and some deep needs that only Jesus can fill. So therefore, we can share with boldness and confidence because the gospel is relevant for everyone. It is life-changing and it is life-transforming. Let us listen to Paul's sermon in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they could seek him and would perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. We are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. There are many precious gems in this sermon, and time does not permit for us to go into details, but let me just highlight a few points. Notice how Paul quoted from the Athenians' <coughs> own poets, for in him we live and move and, <coughs> and have our being and we are his offspring. See, he was being culturally relevant. He did not reason with them from scripture because unlike the Jews in the synagogues, this um, 
Gentile philosophers, they didn't know and they were unfamiliar with the Old Testament. Now secondly, notice how Paul fitted biblical truths into his message. The Bible begins with God as the creator in Genesis and ends with God as judge in Revelation. In the same way, Paul also began his message with God as creator in verse 24 and ended with a warning that Jesus will return one day to judge the world in verse 31. <clears throat> now thirdly, notice how Paul showcased who God is. As he talked about God's attributes, he was at the same time gently refuting the false beliefs of the Athenians. Now we may wonder why Paul did not bring up Jesus more prominently in his sermon. Well, Paul had earlier already laid the groundwork at the marketplace, preaching the good news about Jesus, so the Athenians would have connected the dots. So using Paul's sermon, we have the framework to preach the gospel. Our God is the creator of heaven and earth. He is our maker. He alone deserves our worship, not the things that we make with our hands. Our God rules over all people and nations, all timelines and boundaries. He's closely involved in our lives and he wants to have this personal relationship with us. So God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and for our sins. And Jesus was raised from the dead and his resurrection proved that he has power over sin and death. And Jesus is coming back to judge the world. And everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. Paul concluded his message with this call to repentance. In verse 30, God commands all people everywhere to repent. We need to repent from our idolatry and return to worship our maker. We need to repent from trying to run our own lives our own way without God. Repent and turn to God so that our sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing from the Lord may come to us. How did the Athenians respond to the gospel? Verse 32 to 34 tells us that Paul had a mixed response to his sermon. Some smeared, some wanted to hear him again, and some, some of his most influential intellectuals became followers of Christ. Now what about you? What is your response? If you have never fully given your life to Jesus, would you do so today? And if your relationship with God has been distant and lukewarm, would you give your heart to him and draw near to him? And to all of us believers, Jesus' promise in Acts 1-8 still holds true today. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So would you position yourself strategically where you can be a witness for Christ? A brother in church shared this in our DMG chat group. I believe in this season in my life, my workplace is where God has placed me. Even though my remuneration is nowhere near what I used to get, it is worth it. I pray that God will use me more to meet and reach my colleagues for Christ. Even though my remuneration is nowhere near what I used to get, it is worth it. Wow, this brother, he's willing to sacrifice his pay to be a, in a position to witness for Christ. And it's very encouraging that through his outreach, a number of his colleagues had already become believers. So may we have the same mindset and zeal to identify our mission point and give our all to win souls for Christ. Secondly, preparation. Would you prepare yourself to share the gospel and to defend your faith? Now, some of us may feel inadequate, like, oh, we don't know what to say. But there are tools available to help us. A brother in church went to SKS and he bought this whole lot of tracks with different approaches to the gospel. For example, evidence of God, hope for hard times, finding rest, the greatest chapter in the Bible. He brings all these tracks to his clinic. He puts them in the waiting area and keeps some in the drawer of his desk. And when opportunity arises, he will bring out the appropriate track and give it to his patient. 
So would you also commit to prepare an evangelism toolkit and always carry some tools with you to share? Now, in fact, there's an app that you can download in your handphone called God Tools. This is very user-friendly and you can use it to share the gospel in over 90 different languages. We have used this app to share the gospel with Japanese and Vietnamese friends and three of them came to know the Lord through this. Now, a personal testimony is another very useful tool to prepare. In one of our cell groups, the cell members, they take turns to share their pers tes personal testimonies with each other. They practice and practice so that they will be more prepared and confident to share when called upon. Thirdly, power. Would you learn to par partner the Holy Spirit and rely on his power to share the gospel? Now, a brother in church had this amazing encounter last Christmas when he went street witnessing. Now, when he and his partner stopped to pray, they sense the Holy, Holy Spirit's prompting that there is a girl who is lonely that they need to reach out to. So they searched the streets looking for the girl and they finally found her in a restaurant. Now, this girl, she's a Vietnamese and she's stuck here in Singapore because of COVID. And just as the Holy Spirit had revealed to them earlier, she was feeling very lonely and very homesick. So she was so glad to receive the gospel track from them. So we have the Holy Spirit to empower us. Let us develop this greater sensitivity to his leading, be expectant to hear him, and be ready to obey his prompting. Fourthly, presence. Would you make your presence count and be a living testimony for Jesus? Let me share with you what another church did for the Alpha Outreach. So for icebreakers, they would ask, ask their guests, hey, what is your favourite hawker centre food? Huh? Then the following week, their church members would actually go all out to queue and buy all this specific food for the, for the guests, like the Hill Street Tai Hua Bak Chor Mee that Tuan likes, then Tian Tian Chicken Rice, Dong Baru Sui Jing Bao. So their guests would be so happy. And the next round, they would ask, hey, what's your favourite food? and the guests would receive Del Monte banana, envy apples, or Mao Shan Wang durians. So many of their guests were very touched that they would they had gone the extra mile just to show their love. And this opened the doors very wide for the gospel. So may our lives also be a channel of God's lavish love and goodness and generosity and grace to the people around us. So at this time, I would like to invite our sister Jeanette and brother Noel to come and share a song with us. Now, I love to tell the story is an old hymn written in 1866 by Catherine Henke. She was an evangelist and a missionary to Africa. And the chorus goes, I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Now, would you let this song be the song of your heart and invest your life to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love? to 
tell the old old story of Jesus and his love. Do we really love to tell the story about Jesus? Or have we allowed the fear of men or the fear of rejection to hinder us? Or perhaps it's our lethargy and apathy that cripples us. There are many needs around us and many ways to provide help, but sharing the gospel is paramount because only Jesus can give hope to the hopeless. Only Jesus has the power to heal, to forgive, to transform lives. This morning, shall we ask the Lord, not for comfort, nor convenience, but for a renewed, passion for his name and a deep compassion for his people so that we can say together with Paul in Acts 20 24 my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God as we continue to sing this song if the Lord leads you to make a commitment to give your life to Jesus or to draw close to Him or be a witness for Christ, would you please share with one of our pastors or leaders so that we can come alongside you to encourage you and to support you in your decision.